have have um, have accepted the offer to move closer to the front, and some are still trying to exit out of the auditorium, <laughs> where they can discuss anything they want to. <laughs> Isn't the Lord good? Uh, okay, so I heard saw some of that. That's good. That's that's a wonderful thing. Um, I am going to teach for a while tonight from the title to Discipline and Beyond, or as subtitle, Buzz Lightyear's Conversion to Christianity. We have some people, pa a couple of gentlemen passing out some handouts. Those are for you to take later. We'll reference them. You don't need to really review them right now. Um, but I do want to, there, there, there's so much information, scriptures there, that I think would be really beneficial for you to have. So we're talking about discipline, which um, immediately some people go, ah, 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 you know, because discipline is not fun thing to talk about, and most of us don't particularly like discipline. Um, discipline often brings to mind punishment, because that's one of the definitions. If, if somebody uh, behaves improperly and they're disciplined, that's some type of punishment that is executed upon them. And sometimes we take that thought process of discipline and we bring it into our walk with God and feel like somehow or other the disciplines that we live in Christ are somehow punishment. Okay? And, and uh, they're not. But we often respond that way humanly because that's sort of our mentality. And I, I'm hoping that by the time we're done tonight that you have a different view of that. I want to give you an example of a disciplined life. Now, this is not a spiritual individual. It's not a spiritual discipline. But I want to give you an example of what discipline is and what the rewards or payoff of discipline is. How many of you ever heard of a man by the name of Jerry Rice? Anybody here ever heard of Jerry Rice? Now, th for those who have not heard of Jerry Rice, he was a wide receiver for the San Francisco 49 year, 49ers and pretty much set every kind of record imaginable in the NFL for a receiver, a wide receiver. Bo Eason, who was a former NFL player, shared a personal story about when after he'd been traded to San Francisco 49ers. And I'm just going to sort of read this. Bo is a man with relentless and fierce determination to accomplish anything he set his mind to. When he was in the NFL training, he was always the first one on the field and the last one to leave until the first day of practice with the 49ers. On day one of training, Bo headed out to practice as usual, but when he arrived on the field, Jerry Rice was already out there running. The best player is out on the field first. At one point during the practice, Bo said they all had to line up for a drill where Joe Mantana, another football superstar, threw the ball down the field to them, the receivers, and they had to catch it, then return back to the quarterback and get the ball back to the quarterback. The team formed a line for the drill, and the first player out was a rookie. He started running off at half speed, caught the ball from Joe, jogged back toward Joe, and sort of lobbed it to him and got back in line. Next player in line, same thing. And on this went, half speed run, catch, jog back, lob, return to the line. Then it was Jerry Rice's turn. Boom. Jerry took off in a full sprint, caught the ball, flew down the field to the end zone, and raced back to return the ball to Joe Montana before getting back in the line. Bo said he was stunned. The drill continued again and again. All the other players besides Jerry would run half speed, catch the ball, jog back, return the ball to Joe Montana. But when it was Jerry's turn, boom. Every time he would sprint down the field, catch the ball, race to the end zone. Bo said to himself, what in the world is going on? So at the end of the day, of the first day of practice, Bo approached Jerry and said, what's going on? Why, why do you run at full speed like that? Looking at Bo, Jerry said this, every time these hands touch a ball, this body winds up in the end zone. Huh? He was disciplining himself so that the behavior of his physicality would respond to what he had trained his mind to believe. Now, that's not all he did. 
Jerry Rice was not the fastest wide receiver that's ever played the game. But without a doubt, he was one of the hardest working, one of the strongest trainers that had ever run a wide receiver position. He did so many things in his regimen that I can't begin to tell you, but in my, my reading of it, I used to run a long distance track, and I, I know what goes into training the body for physical exertion. I read it and got tired just thinking about what he did. But what it made him do, he was so disciplined in his regimen of training that when he walked out onto the field, he could shut off his brain, so to speak, and his body would flow through exactly where it had to be at the right time because he had disciplined himself to perform to that level. Now, I wonder if we approached our walk with God with that same kind of intentionality and fervency and passion, if perhaps our walks with God would be more like a superstar getting in the end zone and less like somebody who is needing help. Just wondering. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 9 say, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. Now he makes the reference to exercise, and he points out that bodily exercise profiteth little. Now there are some people who have taken that scripture to mean that bodily exercise is unnecessary. That's really not the case. He's just saying to in invest your life and energy in the exercise that pays off the biggest dividends. And their exercise toward godliness is always going to pay bigger dividends than the physical exercises because eventually, guess what? No matter how much you exercise, you might be the fittest person in the whole world, but you're still going to die. And if you got, go to your grave fit physically, but unfit spiritually, it's not going to do you any good. You walk into the, into the throne room of hell and stand before Satan and say, but look at my biceps. He's not, gonna be ex he's not in any way going to be impressed. Right? So what Paul is saying is that there is an exercise. Now, interestingly enough, the message uh, reads that verse as workouts in the gymnasium are useful, but a disciplined life in God is is far more so. So there are two primary types of discipline that we find in the scripture that promote godliness. First is personal disciplines. This is things that you do, just you. There are also interpersonal disciplines or things we do as a collective body, All right? Now some of those happen in both areas. Some only happen in one. The important thing is that they all have to happen. So some of the disciplines of the Christian life, you're going to know what some of these are. Uh, this is not a surprise in any way that prayer is a personal discipline. Anybody here ever heard anybody from this pulpit ever say anything about prayer? Only one person. My daughter said that she has heard. Everybody else hasn't been listening for the last 20-something years. <laughs> no. Is there a service that goes by that somebody isn't making reference about prayer? You might get the idea that around here that people think prayer might be a little bit important. Now, I think just a few minutes ago that Brother Betcher made reference to the importance of prayer. That was followed up. Was it Brother Betcher or maybe Brother Stephen? Somebody did. Maybe it was over there. Brother Stephen then let us in prayer, corporate prayer. We come together and we pray together, lifting up needs before God and communion with God in prayer. All right? Another discipline is worship. Now, there's some people feel that worship is only done in the corporate setting. But can I tell you that some of the most powerful times of worship that you will ever have in the presence of God is when no one else is there. Now, there are some people that can sing, and there's other people. How do you like that one? That's pretty, pretty smooth, wasn't it? The beautiful thing is, 
while we come together and the Bible says we should play and sing skillfully before the Lord, do you know what? In a sense, God is tone deaf. So if you are not one of those that has a talent for singing, don't worry about it. Because in your personal time with God, God wants your worship regardless whether you can carry a tune in a bushel basket or not. He wants you to bring praises and adoration before him. And the beautiful thing is, he really doesn't care what it sounds like. He cares that it sounds. Did you catch that? Worship is not something that you can do silently. What are you doing? I'm worshiping. Now, you can give adoration. You can perhaps enjoy the presence of God silently. But when you come into a place of worship in the presence of God, you're going to respond somehow. Like the guy said, I'm so excited I could almost shout. <laughs> really? If you're happy, notify your face. Fasting is a personal discipline. Now, we sometimes, as a, as a body, fast. But the amazing thing about fasting is nobody can do it for you. I wish we could have a designated faster. Well, Shane, tomorrow, you're the designated faster for the whole church, and everybody gets to enjoy and reap the benefits of that fast. Don't you wish it was that way? <laughs> it's not. It's a personal discipline. A very wise man and somebody I admire and respect very highly by the name of William Sisko told me once, that if you cannot control your appetite for food, you will never be able to control any of the human or carnal appetites. Hmm. Wow. Solitude is a personal discipline. Now, some of us, especially in the Pentecost ranks, we're really not too big on solitude. But there is, if you read the Bible, which I hope you all do, which, by the way, getting ahead of myself, is another spiritual discipline. But that's another point. If you read the Bible very long, you're going to find that God took people, his people, into various places of solitude. Now then, it's really uncomfortable for, for us because we want noise and activity. And sometimes the best thing we can do is to be in solitude with God. Now we live... And I live very heavily in a technology world. And technology, if it has done nothing else, has come to a place of controlling our every minute. My phone is silenced right now. But even when it's silenced, I'm very aware of its presence. Now, partly because it's sitting right here. But that's because, well, there's supposed to be a timer there to tell me when to stop. The screen went off, so I guess I don't know when to stop, so I'll just keep going. Communion, the Lord's Supper. That's not something you do personally. You do it as a corporate body. That's the instructions of the Word of God. But it's a spiritual discipline. It's something we do to build our relationship with God. Then there's fellowship. Now, fellowship is a strange thing because oftentimes we think we're in fellowship when really we're just in a social setting. Now, I'm going to let that sit there for a second. Now, one person described fellowship as being two fellas in the same ship. Somebody else came along and said, no, it's close, but it's two fellas in the same ship going the same direction. Now, the case in point is my brother and I once went canoeing. It took us a while to figure out the whole paddling thing. Now, he was bigger than I am and stronger than I am, and he was sitting in the back of the boat, and I was in the front of the boat, and we're trying to paddle, and we kept going like this. And it was like he would say, paddle, paddle. I am paddling. But see, it took a while for us to get in fellowship. We were definitely in the same ship, but we weren't moving the same direction. And we had to figure out how to row together to get the thing down the river. All right? So fellowship is not just a social gathering. 
we can all be in social gathering. Now, I don't want to be too down on technology. See, that's how I make my money. But, you know, we can't replace fellowship with Facebook or Twitter. We can't replace spiritual fellowship with the body of Christ with some kind of electronic connection. FaceTime is wonderful, but you can't fellowship with FaceTime. Amen and glory be to Jesus. Let the hallelujahs roll. So the two most important personal disciplines are this. The intake of the word of God and... What do you think? Prayer. Now, I personally believe in that order. Now, it's, it's one of those things that's really hard to tell which is the most important. You know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The Bible talks about the word of God is sharper than two-edged sword, piercing the divide and sunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. That's getting really fine down there. So how do you know which is most important, the word or prayer? Well, it really takes both. You really can't have one without the other, the other without the one. But here's why I feel like the word of God is more important even than prayer, at least in our vernacular mindset. God's word, when I take it in, is God's word to me. He is talking to me. But when I pray, more often than not, I'm talking to him. Now, whose word is more important? His or mine? See, the problem with us more often than not is we spend all of our time in devotion and personal discipline talking to him and very little time allowing him to talk to us. I would much rather spend a half hour in the Word of God and 15 minutes in prayer, I'm speaking generally speaking, than 30 minutes in prayer and 15 minutes in the Word of God. I get a lot more out of the Word when I say, God, talk to me. It's amazing when I let His Word into my heart, how many things that I would have prayed about are taken care of. I'm not saying prayer isn't important. Please understand me. We, I just said we believe prayer is important. But see, sometimes we think, oh, I'm just going to pray. Well, we sit down, and it's like God's a vending machine. We plug in our 15-minute token for prayer, and we expect all the stuff to come out the bottom. And God's sitting there going, whoa, hey, when do I get my time? Well, so, <laughs> sorry, God, but i got to get to work. Now, if God is sovereign and the creator of all the universe and everything that has ever been and ever will be, don't you think that we ought to pay attention to what he might want to say to us? Hmm. Psalm 138, verse 2 in the Amplified Version says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth and faithfulness. For you have exalted above all else your name and your word. Everything else, he's taken his name and his word and exalted it above that. But then the psalmist continued, and you have magnified your word even above your name. Now, what, you read that and go, wow. Now, if we're anything, we're people of the name, right? You hear the name around here a little bit. We spend more time using, talking, preaching, praying the name of Jesus Christ than probably any other religious organization anywhere. I'm not saying this particular local assembly. I'm talking those that believe like we believe. And the name is of absolute importance, is it not? Can I hear a resounding amen? (laughs) There. But the Bible says of itself that his word has been magnified above his name. Why? Well, think about this. Would we know what his name is without the word? Everything we know about God comes from his word. The danger sometimes is that people in their personal life think they've heard from the word of God 
and it's contrary to the word of God. And so they go off this path that leads them into this abyss of false doctrine because they weren't in the word. There are five major disciplines in the Christian life that I want to briefly talk about. The first is prayer. We've talked about that a little bit already tonight. Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 29 says, About eight days after Jesus said this, I'm reading from the NIV, but it's on the King James up above. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, James, and John, John and James with him and went up in the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became bright as a flash of lightning. Amazing thing happened. Two things happened in the time that Jesus was praying. One, his face changed. And two, his appearance to others changed. So when we are in our walk with God, and we are in a place of prayer so that it affects our life, it affects how people view us. Now, my wife has made mention here recently of uh, some situations where people have told her that there's something different about her. Now, she's a beautiful person. I think so. But beauty doesn't cause people to go, what's different about you? We might look at somebody that's beautiful and go, wow, they're really beautiful. But I've met some really beautiful people that were really, really ugly. Right? Now, you can say amen if you want to. It's okay. They were not beautiful. Their physical appearance may have been, but they were not. But when we're in the presence of God, God's presence changes us. The discipline number two is the scripture, and I've already been talking about the word. Listen to what 1 Chronicles 22, verse 19 says. Now devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord your God. Devote. That's not some kind of passive situation. That's an aggressive motion toward a particular object. And the Bible instructs us to devote our heart and soul to seeking the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Study earnestly to present yourself approved to God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I've, I've read that scripture for uh, hundreds of times. And yet, there are times that I don't invest myself in the Word of God the way I really ought to. I get busy. I get out of doing other things. I've got to have distractions. But yet, what the Bible tells me here is that if I want to be approved before God, I need to invest myself in His Word. Life is crazily hectic. I would tell you what my schedule has been like this week, but I don't want to bore you and I only have a certain amount of time and I don't have enough time to tell you what my schedule was this week. But I can tell you this. You have to take and invest yourself in the Word. Now, I love reading the Word and I love studying the Word, but there's been recently something that's changed in my reading of the Word. We'll often, my Chris and I, will be in the bedroom at night, and she's on her iPad reading, and I'm sitting in the recliner, usually on my phone actually reading, and going through the Bible, you version, through the plan, and we're reading the Bible through the year. And all of a sudden, she'll talk up and say, wow, look at this. And she'll start sharing something that she's read in the Word. Or I'll go, oh, wow, look at this. Well, this is sort of a, a weird thing, but this is the way my brain works, if you haven't figured that out. I'm reading the other day, and I'm reading about Josiah. Anybody know who Josiah was? Okay, what do you know about Josiah? Anybody? He was a young king. How many? What? Eight years old. Anybody know who his father was? Ammon. Who said Ammon? Yeah, because I told you about it. 
<coughs> Interesting thing here. Ammon was 22 years old when he started reigning as king. He reigned two years, and his servants rose up and killed him. And then a bunch of other people rose up and killed all the servants that killed him. So if my math is correct, Ammon was 22 when he started reigning king. He was reigned for two years and was killed, which makes him 24. Josiah was 8 when he started reigning, which means that Ammon fathered Josiah when he was 16. I'd never noticed that before. Now, you say, what does that have to do with anything that's going to, in fact, impact your life? Well, see, you've got to understand that that whole portion of Scripture, Ammon's father and Ammon's father, father and Ammon's father's father's father, and the people came after Josiah, the Bible continually says everything they did was wicked in the sight of God, and God basically hated it. There's a guy by the name of Manasseh, and if you read in the book of Kings, you're going to hear Manasseh's name 150 times or something like that. I haven't counted. And every time it references to Manasseh, which Manasseh was Josiah's great-great-grandfather, I think, every time it mentions it, it mentions Manasseh in a negative way, God saying he was evil, he did everything evil, he turned Israel away from God, and the people that followed him were evil, and everything they did was evil. And then along comes Josiah at eight years of age with all this, when his father was 16 when he was born and somehow this 8-year-old kid figured out, you know what, I need to walk right with God. Now that to me is pretty impressive. Then you say, okay, well that's a lesson to me. During Josiah's reign, the kingdom went pretty good. Everybody else, <laughs> bottom line, you want this? You might want to walk with God. You want this? Live evil. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Discipline number three, fasting. Eh. Listen to this quote. Whenever the obsession to satisfy our stomachs becomes greater than our need to satisfy, satisfy our Savior, then God leaves it to us to fast. Moving on. Dr. Tony Evans said, fasting, describes fasting as the deliberate abstinence from some form of physical gratification to achieve a greater spiritual goal. My wife and I were on vacation last week, and we were at, well, actually, it was before we left for vacation. We were at a restaurant. And she had a filet mignon that was, without a doubt, the absolute best filet I've ever seen tasted in my life. Now, I had almond-crusted halibut, and it was really good. But that filet was like, wow. Oh, it was very satisfying. And we walked from that restaurant, and we were so full. It was like, I'm not going to eat for another week. Guess when we ate next? I uh, know it's a little more than that. It's the next morning. So it really wasn't all that gratifying, was it? Just thought I'd throw that out. Mark 9.29 said, And he said unto them, This kind can come out by nothing except by prayer and fasting. Matthew 17.21, However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 35, and he said to them, him, why do John's disciples fast often and make prayers and also the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? But he said to them, can you make the sons of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? Notice what he says, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. Now the bridegroom has gone. He is somewhere preparing the place for his bride, which is us. He's not here. He's coming back, and he's coming back for a bride that is ready to meet him. And he said, when the bridegroom leaves, then we will fast. I don't like to fast. You know, there's people that I talk to that they talk about fasting, and they go, 
yeah, I fasted for three days, and, you know, I really didn't ever miss food. Were you cheating? <laughs> right? You know, I, I, I've been on some long fasts. I've been on short fasts. But I can tell you every fast is long. Y you get what I mean? Yeah, all right. It's just there's something about food that really does interest me. It's not just self-preservation. I really enjoy eating. And really good food, I even enjoy more. Bad food, I'll tolerate, but good food, I'll really, really enjoy. I tell people all the time, when we got married, it was a match made in heaven. She likes to cook, I like to eat. What could be better than that? Fasting is a discipline, but fasting is so important in our discipline and our walk with God. It, if nothing else, it shows that the spirit that's within me has dominion over the flesh that I live with. If nothing else, and I'm not going to get into a whole dissertation about fasting tonight. That's not the point. The point is, one of the disciplines of our walk with God is fasting. And i got to tell you, it's not one I particularly enjoy. Now then, for many, many years, I was sick and I was on some really, really nasty medications, and I couldn't fast. A fast for me meant I, I skipped a meal, maybe. I might have to have some crackers or something in the middle of it. And so my brain would like to tell me, my flesh would like to tell me, now when I want to fast, all those old habits of years gone by say, well, you can't do that because you need to eat because of, and it's like, dirty, rotten, lying devil. I haven't dealt with rheumatoid arthritis for years, and I haven't been on medication for 16 years. And get out of here. And you know how it goes. What happens when you decide to fast? Somebody calls you up and says, hey, you want to meet me for lunch? You walk into your place of business, and somebody has come in with Krispy Kremes or Panera Bed muffins or something, and you walk in, and somebody's having a birthday, and they've got your, your most favorite cake, and you, everywhere you turn, there's food. And some of you are going, get off it because I haven't eaten supper. <laughs> but we need to fast. Discipline number four, worship. Now then, it seems odd to use the term discipline and worship in the same sentence in a certain case because we all typically enjoy worshiping when we finally get there. But how, you don't need to raise your hand, nod your head, or say amen or oh me, but how many of you on your way to church were thinking, man, I wish I could stay home, I'm so tired? Somebody was. I know it because humanity is just that way. And sometimes you get into the house of God and things just aren't really rosy for you right at the moment. And you go, oh, man, now they're going to sing that song. But somehow if you can discipline your flesh to set aside the discomfort, the pain, the tiredness, the whatever, 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 and move into the presence of God, something amazing begins to happen. All of a sudden, you're not so tired, and all of a sudden, you're not so achy, and now all of a sudden, the day wasn't quite so bad because you're in the presence of God. But you had to discipline yourself and your mind to move past that into his presence. To me... The key to living a successful Christian life is living in a place of worship. And you say, oh yeah, I'd like to put up camp right here. That's not what I meant. We somehow have categorized worship again to be something that we do when we come together or maybe even something we do in our house, but worship is where you live. Every moment of your life, every breath you breathe, every thought you think, every word you say, if you have completely, absolutely, 100% submitted your life to God, your very life is worship. 
And so the work that you do and the things that you do and the school you go to and the cleaning the toilets as you're working in that or doing whatever you do, everything that you do, if it's submitted before God, becomes an act of worship. And you can live in that place of worship. And in that place, no matter how menial and bad it may be, you can live in the presence of the Almighty. And if you live there, you're going to be successful in your walk with God. Five, service. Service. If we are to live like Christ, then service cannot be an optional exercise. It's got to be a regular part of our life. What do I mean by service? I'm not necessarily talking about helping little old ladies across the street. But it could be. That could be part of the ministry of the gifts of helps. But service is what we do for the kingdom of God. <coughs> Our willingness to serve is an indication that we are maturing in spiritual values. When my daughter is holding, is that Joy? My daughter is holding Joy, right? What a great name, isn't it? But you know what? Joy, other than her peaceableness and how beautiful a child she is contributes nothing to life. She right now receives constantly. Constantly. It's feed me, change me, burp me, sleep me, hold me, done, feed me, change me. And the cycle goes on. Many of you are parents. You've been through the cycle. Three o'clock in the morning, does the baby care that you're tired? No, the baby says, feed me, change me, burp me. Right? And life goes on. And when it's time to get up for work and you're exhausted and you've got toothpicks in your eyelids, the baby says, feed me, change me, burp me, sleep. Right? The problem is that when we come into God, we come as infants who need a lot of feed me, burp me, change me. Right? It's all this way. But there comes a time in our walk with God where this way needs to become this way. A healthy church is not a church that can survive on this. It becomes inward, and any time a group of people turn inward, they destroy each other. So a healthy, maturing church begins to turn from inside and begins to turn to the outside. Now, the outside may be to my brother or to my sister, or it could be to the lost, or it could be to the poor, or it could be to the hurting. It's something other than taking care of me. We live in a world that is me first. And when we come into the church, that's a battle in our flesh that we have to fight and discipline ourselves to the point where we come to the place where service becomes a natural flow of our walk with God. Our church is wonderful. We have so many people that have servant hearts. Not every church is quite that way. There's something called the 80-20 rule where 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. I don't think our church is in that ratio. Last year, I think it was, we had a meeting where we had all the different people that were involved in different aspects of ministry come together for a meeting. It was amazing how many people were coming into that meeting. A, a wonderful thing. But it's really easy for us to lose sight of our discipline of service. There are times in our walk with God where we're hurting and we need somebody to help us. But we need to make sure we're constantly turning back the other way and letting the Spirit flow out of us. My good friend and mentor, Pastor John Grant, said this, the only way to prove you've overcome greed is by your willingness to give. I've heard that once, I've heard it a hundred times. It, you know, now that I think about it, oftentimes it was in relationship to an offering, but 
James chapter 2, verse 18 in the Amplified says, But someone will say to you then, You say you have faith, and I have good works. Now, you show me your alleged faith apart from any good works, if you can, and I, by good works of obedience, will show you my faith. So, you can talk all you want about how that you care for God and you're in love with God, but if you don't care for your brother, the Bible says you don't love God. It's pretty strong stuff. The amazing thing about discipline is this. Back to Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice wasn't the fastest. He wasn't the best. And coming out of college, some doubted that he'd ever become an elite wide receiver. But he worked, trained, and developed himself to the point that even though he wasn't the best, he became the best because of his discipline. Spiritually, I can tell you about some people that I've known who if you looked at them, talked with them around them, you would think, wow, not very impressive. But then when you start being around them for a while, you find out the impact that they had on people around them. It's amazing to me that I, I listen whenever I can, and it's getting harder and harder to do this because the material is getting harder to find. J.T. Pugh, one of the most phenomenal Christians I've ever met. I've had the privilege of being with him, sitting with him, talking with him, driving him to various places. If you listen to J.T. Pugh pre pre preach, he wasn't necessarily the best order. He spoke very well. He was very thoughtful, and I love to hear him preach, but there's other people that they preach, and man, it's like a silver tongue, right? What was the difference between them and J.T. Pugh? J.T. Pugh had an absolute passionate determination to live every moment for God. Can I tell you about James Kilgore, J.T. Pugh, Jack Yance? If you had any opportunity to talk to any of those men and many others, if you talked with them about their life with God, it wasn't very long in the conversation that you found out they didn't do what they did because they were disciplined. They did what they did because they had come to discipline and then moved beyond it into relationship. See, discipline will get us to a point. But after a while, discipline is just plain old hard work. And if we just discipline ourselves in the walk with God and never come to a place where I am absolutely head over heels in love with him as my Savior, discipline becomes old and drudgery. But relationship will change my life. Discipline is never going to go away. You never stop praying. You never stop investing in the Word of God. You never stop, fa well, you can stop fasting, you know, every once in a while. You never stop doing those things. But if you only do them out of discipline, you're missing the joy of salvation. You've got to move beyond discipline. You've got to say, I'm going to discipline my life until I come to a place where that discipline is like Jerry Rice. It's just the way I am. Is this, it's making sense. Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in him. 1 Peter 2.22, 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace. 1 Corinthians 13.11 says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Hebrews 5.12 says, By this time you ought to be teachers yourselves, yet here I find you again, needing someone to sit down with you and go over the basics of God again. Hebrews 6.1-3, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now, do you think the writer of Hebrews was saying that we leave the doctrines? No. He wasn't saying, you go, Pat, any more than Christ was saying, I've done come to do away with the law. He didn't come and do away with the law. Jesus said of the law, I've come to fulfill the law. See, we don't, we don't look at this and say we leave the principles. Well, we're never going to have to worry about that again. No, we've got to go past the foundation and start building the building. 
Discipline builds the foundation, but my relationship builds the house. The message says that rendering of Hebrews 6. So come on, let's leave the preschool finger painting exercise on Christ and get on with the grand work of art. Grow up in Christ. The basic foundational truths are in place. Turning your back on salvation by self-help. Oh, does that world need to hear that? And turning in toward trust toward God. Now then, my wife and I have been privileged over the last year or so to be involved in some young couple mentoring situations where we're teaching some material to couples that are going to get married. And we have said, as we've talked, we wish we had heard all that stuff 38 years ago. Maybe I wouldn't have gray hair, and maybe she wouldn't either. The gray hair is because, not because of her. The gray hair is because, like, what have I done now? <laughs> and we have learned that there's some principles in, in relationships some very important principles of relationships. And they work whether you're talking about husband and wife or friend to friend or aunt to uncle or whatever. So we're going to demonstrate a couple of these uh, principles of relationship to you so that you can see how that interacts with our walk with God. Okay? Is that all right? So one of the principles of relationship is that you need to spend time with one another. Correct? So, honey, let's spend some time together. You got, you got the clock? You got the timer? Is it set for 15 minutes? Because we need to spend at least 15 minutes together. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to make it fast, okay? So we need to, every day, we need to spend some time together talking about the day and what happened and everything. Ready? S can you start the timer? Oh, it's already started? Okay, how was your day? Good. What happened? Um, not much. Not much? Really? Oh. Did you work today? Yeah, I went to work this morning. I was out of town, so I'm not sure. Was I out of town today or was that yesterday? Yeah, I was at home today because I'm here. So um, did we get any mail? I didn't get the mail in. Oh, oh, I got the mail in. Oh, it was there when I got it. How, how are we doing on time? We, doing, we got a minute and a half yet? Okay, good. Isn't this fun? Yeah. I'm really enjoying our time together. Aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Um, how are we doing on time? We, we want to make sure we spend time together, so we need to do this every day, right? Right. Okay. What, what else is on your mind? Well, I made some plans with the grandkids uh, yesterday. Really? Oh, what did you do? We brainstormed. Yeah. Okay. Brainstormed? There were some storms up in Madison, I know, because it took a bunch of servers out, and I worked had to work today fixing servers. That's the nature of the business. Yeah, it is. How are we doing there on time? Pretty good? How, how are you feeling about our relationship? Is it getting better? Oh, I'm sorry. We probably don't want to get into that because I'm not sure that we really have time to cover that subject. I didn't have school today. You didn't? That's good. I'm not going to ask the question that just came to my mind. <laughs> 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 well, that's nice. What did you eat? Nothing. Did you fast? Yeah. <laughs> that's why you didn't have to cook. Well, fasting is spiritual discipline, isn't it? How are we doing on time there? Wow, 15 seconds. Is there anything else you want to talk about? No. Uh, well, man, we covered all this before we even ran out of time. That's awesome. Thanks, honey. We'll do this again tomorrow. Now, how long do you think this marriage is going to last? 12 more minutes. Isn't that crazy? But how often do we approach our relationship with God, well, the church says that I need to make sure I pray every day and I need to spend at least 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. I've heard them all. A good friend of mine said, you pray until you can't quit. And that's when you know you've prayed enough. I don't make it to the, quite that point most days. I'm just being honest with you. There are some days I get in the presence of God and an atomic bomb would go off and I wouldn't know about it. I'd probably be dead, but, you know. <laughs> but do you get, you get the impact of that? Now, that's silly, isn't it? But if all we did was practice the discipline of a marriage relationship, there is no relationship. 
a man who I have come to admire. I really don't know that much about his theology, so I'm not putting him on a pedestal saying his theology is right. But he has some insight into personal devo- what he calls personal devotions. In an interview, he was asked about his life with Christ and how he handled his personal devotions. This is what he said. It's not a formula. It's not an activity. It's a relationship. I don't put it down into all the things I do to try and have a relationship with God. I have a relationship with God, and out of that comes the things that I do. It's not a series of activities that leads to a relationship. It's a relationship that leads to a series of activities. There is nothing I could do, be doing that has any greater significance or any greater potential for directing my life than my time alone with God. Wow. I actually heard that on a CD I was listening as I was traveling a couple weeks ago. And in a car, it's sort of hard sometimes to dial back on your CD. But when I got to where I was going and I plugged the CD into a computer that had a CD and I listened to that interview time and time again because I wanted that to resonate in my spirit. And it was sort of out of that comment that I began to inspect and examine my own relationship with God and realized that I was doing a lot of things out of discipline, which is good, and not out of relationship, which is not good. The aspect is this, that sometimes when we come to God, we do things out of discipline because we don't know anything else to do. We're babes. How do I survive? How do I have a successful walk with God? How do I mature in Christ? Well, you need to pray, and you need to pray. Here's a way you can pray, and we give them the prayer clock. Or we give them the five fingers of prayer. Or we give them some other tool or utility that somebody who doesn't know how to pray and have conversation with God, that they can sort of have a pattern to follow. And it's okay. It's wonderful. But see, if after... I'm, I'm 59 years old. I received the Holy Ghost when I was eight. I've been in this way of life my whole life. If right now, today, I had to have the prayer clock or the five fingers of prayer to be able to have a conversation with God, I'm in trouble. I am spiritually handicapped. Or whatever the correct, correct phrase is these days. You understand what I'm saying? No, it's got to move beyond just discipline and move to where I am in love with Christ to the point I don't want to be away from him. My wife and I have been married 38 years. Most of my our married life, for some weird reason, I've had to travel. I don't like it any more today than I did when we first got married. Right, Brother Brian? When I'm away, part of my thought process is always at home. And I made comment of this a few weeks ago, that the trip home seems to take forever because it's where I want to be. And it seems to me sometimes in my walk with God that it's taking forever to get home because my heart isn't here. Brother Jerry and I will have conversations at work situations, and he's made the comment so many times, I just want to go home. I just, I'm so tired of this. I just want to be with Christ. That's not exact quotes, but it's pretty much the right message. I want to be with him. To the point that sometimes I I wish I could just shut everything off and put up a tent and stay here until I realize I can have a tent in the presence of God no matter where I am, not just here. And the beautiful thing to me is as much as I could desire that, it doesn't become, it doesn't even get anywhere close to scratching the surface of the desire that Christ has 
toward me. As much as I could want him, he wants me more. As you stand with me, Dr. Blackaby said in this interview that he distinctly remembers the time. Now, he admitted he's now retired. He doesn't have the pressures and demands of schedules. He has people that do that. <laughs> That's a beautiful place to be. But he said there was a time in his walk with God, in his personal devotion, where he was going through his personal time with God, and God stopped him with the phrase, Henry, you're rushing me. Hmm. I wonder how many times God has said, hey, can you slow down a minute? You're rushing our time. I just want a little more time with you. Can I just, can you give me just a little bit more time? There's some things I want to show you. He's the creator and master of the universe. My little pittance of a life compared to that, and I get bent out of shape and worried I might not get my work done? Come on, really? I trust him with my finances. I don't remember the last time my wife and I didn't pay tithes. As a kid, I don't remember ever, ever in my entire life not paying tithes. It was drilled into me as a kid. I mowed along and got 50 cents. Five cents of that went in the offering. Oh, I was like, <laughs> look at me. Now the lights can stay on another five seconds. I don't remember the last time I was worried about whether my ties were going to affect my ability to pay my bills or not. You understand? Now, I've been worried about my ability to pay ties, but not, or, or my bills, but not because I was paying ties. I never, I, do you remember the last time we had a conversation, should we pay ties or not? No, it, it's so much part of my way of life, I can't even imagine it. You know what, I've actually sat and talked with people who said, I can't afford to pay tithes, and I've told them, look, you pay your tithes, and if you can't pay your bills, you bring the bills to me and I'll pay them for you. Now, that's not an open offer, by the way. <laughs> I just thought to clarify that. That was in a situation where I felt, you know, unction from the Spirit. <laughs> You know what? I have never once had to do that. Never. Now, the next person I tell that to, I may have to pay their car payment. I don't know. You know what? It's okay. I, what I'm saying is that why is it that we can trust him with our finances, but we can't trust him with our time? <laughs> I'm so busy. I got so much to do. It's okay. I think the last time I checked... God created this thing called time. If he so desired, he could make it stand still so you could finish your job. I got a Bible for that. So, as I close here, so we are not having a, somebody on the keyboard, but that's okay. I'm inviting you to come and commit yourself afresh tonight to relationship that goes beyond discipline. Do we leave discipline behind? No, no, we're always going to have that. But we want to move into that place of real relationship where all those things that we do are really not what we do, it's who we are. Let me pray. God, I'm so thankful for your word. It's really convicted me as I was studying the last few days. And I pray that it would be more than conviction, but it would bring a change in my own life. I'm so thankful for your long suffering. I'm so thankful for your patience, for the mercies and grace that are new every day. I don't deserve it, Lord, but I'm so thankful for it. God, help me to see beyond just the things that I have to do and help it become things that are part of my life. Thank you for it, Jesus. I thank you for it, Jesus. Would you like to come and pray?